look at Baptist history every morning, and uh, this morning uh, we've been looking at 50 Baptists you should know, and this morning we're on number 49, so we're almost there. And um, so this morning I want to look at, uh, as I said, we've gone back a, a few years, and I'm looking at uh, three men, uh, and this week and last week and next week, uh, that uh, were not pastors or full-time workers, um, and uh, just look at their testimony and, and how God had used them. So this morning I'm going to talk about a man who... Um, very successful in his business career, but to start back with his father, Robert Colgate, was awake in the middle of the night in a city uh, just outside of London in March of 1795. It seems that William Pitt, the Prime Minister of England, had sent a private messenger to warn his friend, uh, Robert, that he must leave England immediately or risk imprisonment or even death. Robert had sympathized with the American colonists during the recent war for independence, and that put him in danger with the fickle George III. Um, and uh, the King, King George III. And within hours, Robert and his family had boarded a ship for America where they would eventually settle in the Hudson Valley in New York. There, uh, he took up farming, taught his son farming, his young son William, and they also learned um, the manufacture of soap and candles. Uh, the Colgates were very sincere Christians, and uh, little William was saved as a boy shortly after coming to America. He would later remember the family devotions and specifically um, how his mother and father emphasized, it seemed a lot to him as a young boy, um, the tithe and taught him at the very least 10% of every dollar uh, is the Lord's. Uh, the, the, the Colgates were very poor. Farming uh, did not work um, uh, for them. And at age of 16, uh, William left home and went to New York City to find work. When he arrived in New York, um, he had traveled with, um, on a boat for part of the journey, uh, and he met uh, actually the boat captain who was a, a godly Christian man. And the boat captain gave him this advice when he, when he left, when he walked off the boat. He said they had kind of struck up a friendship for the for short time they were together, and he said, someone will soon be the leading soap maker in New York. It may as well be you as anybody else. And then he said something that reinforced what William had heard from his father and mother so much. He said, um, give your heart to Christ. Give the Lord all that belongs to him. Make an honest soap, if that's what you're going to do. Give a full pound and God will, God will prosper you. Uh, little William, he's 16 years old now, um, and he is coming to New York City. You can imagine uh, alone uh, looking for work. Um, as he read his Bible, he was intrigued uh, with Jacob's vow to God in Genesis 28. And I want to read those verses to you um, in verse 20 through 22. It says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Uh, Jacob's vow really challenged William, and he prayed the exact same prayer to God. Um, he determined to give God first place in his life and give him at least 10% of everything he, he earned. It did not take him long to find work. He was a very industrious boy, and he became an apprentice to a soap boiler. Um, in the early 1800s, most, most women produced their own soap at home. They would make, make their soap at home, and, and a soap maker would probably be a pretty dead-end career uh, at that time. Uh, but William was pretty astute and industrious, and he applied himself to everything he could learn about soap and, and the making of soap. Um, he, he did not learn just about the process, but he envisioned how to mass produce the product and, and make it cost effective, and, and even how to convince the homemaker of the day, who made her own soap, uh, to buy it from him. And so uh, by 1809, um, he had joined forces with a man who was making soap, and that, that man died. He took over that factory. He was well on his way to becoming an extremely wealthy man. In 1811, he met and married Mary Gilbert. God would give them 11 children. All those 11 children followed their fathers uh, in his footsteps and, and, and did what we're going to hear now, what, what, uh, what William Colgate was able to do. For the very first dollar that he earned, William Colgate tithed faithfully, um, um, and he held faithfully to these commands and the promises in God's word. Um, he actually opened a bank account uh, that, for the Lord, he called it, and, and, and uh, instructed his, his bookkeeper to deposit 10% of everything I make into that, that account so nothing is forgotten, and we make sure that, that the Lord gets his, 
his tithe. His, his business began to grow in an unusual way. Um, his ability to manufacture sweet-smelling soap uh, for hand use cultivated uh, a cap <laughs> Uh, catapulted him into the, giant, into the giant of the soap industry. And from there, the company branched out into other products and other scented products. Now, we, we are so familiar with this now, but imagine in the early 1800s, soap did not have a smell. In fact, it, it stunk. Uh, and uh, uh, it's made out of fat and things like that. And so, um, so this was unusual. And for him to scent that product just catapulted his name across the world. His, began, his business began to grow in a very unusual way. Um, and uh, he was an ardent student of the Bible, and soon after he and Mary were married, uh, they came to Baptist convictions from their, from their very own personal Bible study. They joined the First Baptist Church of New York City, later transferring their membership to the Oliver Street Baptist Church, where he served for the rest of his life. Uh, Oliver Street um, Baptist became the origination of many national movements of Baptist ministries around the world. And the Bible was always a source, of course, his encouragement and, and interest. And he was greatly interested in the translation and the distribution um, and publication of scriptures. And while serving as a deacon there at Oliver Street Baptist Church, he, um, he helped create the American Bible Society. Um, this organization would, in his lifetime, print millions of Bibles that were spread around the world. Um, through his church, he personally um, was a great benefactor of missionaries across the world, many of them never knowing where the money was coming from. In fact, um, he was one of the largest supporters of Adoniram Judson, who we studied, um, and his work there in Burma. I'm not sure if Judson even knew that, but uh, much of Judson's uh, support came from William Colgate. Uh, later, because of this philanthropy, um, Madison University was formed as a Baptist school. It was renamed Colgate University. Uh, I think it's still named Colgate University today after his death. And it's interesting to note that he favored giving annual gifts to organizations rather than setting up endowments. And I, I, you, know, you, you, you wonder why. And he, he said that because he feared that the institutions that he was giving money to would change their biblical philosophy if he set up an endowment that would just go on into perpetuity. And so his idea was, I want to make sure they're following scripture and they're staying straight and, and I'll give them, uh, give them money as long as they do that. His business prospered almost supernaturally, and he continued to increase his tithe. Soon he was giving 20%, 30 40 50%. Uh, by the end of his life, um, he was giving God um, basically 100% of his, of his income. He, he believed that giving starved selfishness. I think that's a very interesting phrase that he used. And it seemed that his sales increased in proportion to his generosity and God, proper, God would prosper his hard work um, in return for his faithfulness. Soon his make of soap became a household word, th uh, word throughout the world. It's very possible that every one of us in this room have a Colgate Palmolive uh, product in their home right now. And um, so this company became Colgate Palmolive and now brings uh, the world a, a variety of dental care, dishwashing soap, um, perfumes, toilet articles, soaps, all these are in, in every civilized country in the world. And this, uh, his name and reputation, the Colgate and Company, is all that William Colgate would have had it, a true reflection of his high ideals and, and uh, ideas as his founder. And no matter how rich he became, God came first. And he set out to prove God's promise in Malachi. And, and God did indeed pour uh, out blessings from heaven. He built a great fortune and a great business through honoring God with his... Um, with his substance. Praise the Lord, the Lord this morning for this man, this Bible-believing Baptist that God used to spread his word. Um, I'll, I'll paraphrase Matthew 3.10, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith. Uh, William Colgate died in March of 1857, and for those that know his story, uh, his testimony still lives around the world. And you might think of that next time you uh, see a Colgate product in the grocery store, an amazing testimony. Um, when, you, when you study his life, um, even the unsaved world is amazed by what, what happened. They all, and, and it's very clear, clearly presented in all his biographies and, and all that you read about him, about his, his giving and, and how God, he made it very clear that God was blessing him because of his giving. And uh, what a testimony. And uh, I want to thank the Lord this morning for William Colgate.